Welcome to this edition of Rattling Bars. I'm Master Musa. And I'm Maximilian Alvarez, Editor-in-Chief here at The Real News Network. As you all know, last month on February 13th, our comrade, colleague, friend, and mentor, Marshal Eddie Conway, joined the ancestors, surrounded by friends and loved ones. There's really, you know, no way that we can sum up uh, how much Eddie meant to us here at The Real News and beyond. Uh, his loss is, uh, it, frankly, incalculable. And, you know, for the past month, we have been grieving Eddie's loss, but we've also been um, talking amongst ourselves, me talking with Mansa, Mansa talking with Eddie's family and the rest of our staff. And we've really been trying to kind of take stock of what a gift it was to know Eddie and work with Eddie and, you know, be influenced by him and his incredible revolutionary heart. And we want to continue that for Rattling the Bars, the show that Eddie himself founded after uh, being released from prison where he was unjustly incarcerated for 44 years after being framed and wrongfully imprisoned in 1971 without proper legal representation. Um, again, there, there's so much that we could say about Eddie Conway and so much that you all know, I'm sure, from watching this incredible show, which we are now honored to have Mansa Musa hosting every week. Um, but we thought it was important, you know, on top of live streaming the uh, memorial service for Eddie, which you all can watch on the Real News Network channel. If you go to uh, our past live stream section, you can see uh, the memorial service for Eddie, where Mansa uh, himself, along with uh, a number of other comrades, family members, and loved ones, uh, gave really beautiful tributes to Eddie. Uh, you can go watch that anytime that you want. But here on Rattling the Bars, we wanted to make some space to reflect on, on uh, you know, Eddie's life and legacy and how that legacy, you know, has touched all of us and how we are going to carry on his fight uh, as we know he would want us to. And so in that vein, uh, Mansa, I'm really honored to be on the show with you today, man. And I just wanted to first say what an incredible honor it's been to have you come on the show. I know that... You know, it really meant a lot to Eddie to have you kind of take over the hosting duties, um, and you've really done incredible things with the show. So first, I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to work with you, brother. And, and I appreciate that. I, I, I think I told Kay the last time I was down here that she was a wonderful host, but that was my sentiment for the entire Real News staff. Uh, Y'all welcomed me, you know, uh, on Eddie's word. Uh, it would have made a difference if, you know, y'all would say no it would have made a difference because y'all have a voice in this matter. But I'm confident in that he chose me because he thought I would be capable of meeting the standard that the real news has set, mm. more so than bringing a friend on, but being putting me in a space where I would keep the standard alive. And I'm thankful that I've been able to, to make a small contribution. Hell yeah, man. I mean, I think... Um... Yeah, the contribution has been incredible. Um, and yeah, I think it's just been such a, a beautiful thing to watch. Obviously, for the past year, we've known that Eddie's been, you know, fighting valiantly to, to recover in the hospital. And we've been sending nothing but love and solidarity to him, to his wife, Dominique, to their family and friends, hoping, you know, that, that he would make a full recovery. But obviously, the, the, the ancestors wanted him back. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, who are we to, to deny them, uh, you know, their, their Eddie? Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think that, yeah, like, just over the past year, seeing how you have really kind of taken that, that responsibility of, of carrying on this show that Eddie believed in so much, um, carrying on the purpose of that show and the humanity in that show, but also making it your own, right? You know, really letting more of yourself come through in the interviews and, and getting more comfortable with the interview style. It's just been a real pleasure to watch. And like, that was actually one of the reasons that I wanted to kind of sit down and have this chat um, because we recently published an incredible interview that you did for Rattling the Bars. It was our, our Malcolm X, you know, episode that we published on the anniversary of his assassination. 
Right. And I feel like I got to see a different side of you in that interview. Right. Well, like I kind of saw it when you came on my podcast, Working People, and we talked a bit more about your political trajectory. And then when you were doing that interview for Rattling the Bars a couple of weeks ago, you I, I just heard you kind of talking about being in the prison yard with Eddie and other folks on the inside, flipping over these these milk crates with your little red books and talking about, you know, radical political theory, organizing, like really raising your own consciousnesses in the most hopeless of places. And I was like, man, I want to know more about that. Mm -hmm. So like, so before we we get to that, I want to just, for folks who watch you every week, uh, who, who tune into Rattling the Bars, who knew Eddie and now know you, I was wondering if like we could just sort of let them know a little bit more. And if you could talk a little bit uh, about how you came to know Eddie Conway. Like, who were you when you came into the prison system and met Eddie? What was that like? What kind of conversations did you guys get into? You know, and that's, that's very interesting, Max, because when I came I came into the prison, uh, I had just received a life sentence in the Maryland Penitentiary. I had, uh, I got convicted of a crime that involved the police. So I knew that my situation, at best, I was going to be in prison for a long time. And so immediately while I was in the county jail, I started reading and becoming like more aware of the social conditions that black people was in and poor people in general. When I got into the Maryland Penitentiary, I came into Maryland Penitentiary February 29th of 73. March the 28th of, of uh, 73, they had a ride. The following day, I got locked up, beat up a little bit, and put on lockup. So for the, about 30 days, I was on lockup. Mm. And then they let me out in the population. And the whole entire time I was on lockup, they was, Eddie and the collective, they was aware where I was at, and they was monitoring what was going on with me. But that was unbeknownst to me. Mm. So when I got out, I had a... Uh, it's a comrade named Tahaka, who, by the way, has served over 51 years, so we try to get him out now. He approached me and, and told me that about the collective. You know, they had a group called Merlin Penn and the Communal Survival Collective, which was like a hybrid of the Black Panther Party. Mm. And asked me, did I want to be a part? I said, yeah. So he introduced me to Eddie. But in terms of like Eddie, Eddie, Eddie is not, a person that when you come in contact with, you don't, you know, you don't feel like you in the presence of royalty. You just feel like, like, hey, what's mm -hmm. up, man? Mm -hmm. You know, he that kind of person. But more importantly, his his encounter with me and his engagement with me was like, you know, where you at? Where you sleeping at? How you doing? What's your situation, bro? You know, what's your plans? You know, this and, and trying to get a general understanding of what my thinking was. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, you know, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get out of prison. Uh, right now, I don't really know too much about prison. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't have no problem being a part of the collective. So he said, okay, well, what, what do you want to do in it? So I said, well, anything. He said, okay, we got a library. Mm -hmm. So he said, go get, he said, we got these books in different kinds. Right? So make sure you get all the books and put them, and put a list together of all the books. So, and so Eddie assigned you a reading list. A reading list, <laughs> yeah, automatically, right? Mm -hmm. So I get all the books, get them all together. But I'm dragging and procrastinating about putting the list together. So he waited about four or five days. He said, like, you got the list? I'm like, nah, man, you know. I'm, this is the first time I've been out and being able to rip and run, so I'm doing a lot of other things, like, you know, playing basketball, stuff that I, I like to do mm -hmm. that I couldn't do in the county jail. But what happened was, because I took that library and we were just starting to organize our classes because on the heels of that ride, they had just let they just let, let the population back out. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got back in population, the general population was just getting back out, maybe it had been out a month prior to me coming out. So they weren't allowed to be together either. So that's when we started. So we, we had got together and decided we're going to have our, they're going to create our classes. So we had a series of classes that we would attend political education, guerrilla warfare, first aid, you know, stuff like that to, mm. to make us aware of what's going on and make and, and prepare us. And so we're having a political education class. He 
said, well, look, you're going to teach the first political education class when we resume. And I'm like, well, what is that? <laughs> what is a political education yeah. class? And so that led us to going and we every day we were going to bleachers with the Red Book. And we was and and we went through the whole on contradiction in the Red Book. And he explained the 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 dialect what dialectal materialism is, what contradiction is, but more importantly he explained it in the context of of uh, looking at it in a society perspective, mm -hmm. the, the contradiction between the have and the have not, the the fact that if you have a you know a situation where your subjective conditions, meaning your organization, right, your subjective conditions in your organization might not be commensable with your with the objective condition. Mm -hmm. So you go out and say like, well, we're gonna plan to uh, have a strike. So we want to organize a strike as an organization, but subjectively, internally. Everybody's scared of the masses. Mm -hmm. So ain't nobody, so when you say like, okay, like go out, pass out literature, pass out pamphlets in the most oppressed areas, the people don't do it. So then when you come calling the strike, ain't nobody out there but mm -hmm. you and somebody else. So he was explaining that when you organize, you have to make sure your internal is commensable with your external. Mm -hmm. So your internal, which is the organization, is educated enough to be able to effectively organize people. Mm. And this is what he bestowed on me, that sense of understanding that, okay, no matter what, when you're talking about organizing, make sure that you understand that principle, that don't think the fact that you have a lot of rhetoric, that people being very rhetorical, people angry, mm -hmm. that's going to convert into being effective in terms of or changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. That's only going to be effective in terms of making people feel good at that moment. Right. But when they leave out of there, what are they going to do? So. I think that's like, it's such a critical tool for any organizer to learn, right? It's like, it's not just about knowing all the theory or even all the history, right? It's like, you have to be able to understand how people work, mm -hmm. including yourself, right. like, and got to start by understanding yourself right. and, what, and how you feel and why you feel that way and how you became the person you are. And I know, and then from there, you can engage more thoughtfully and successfully in the art of mobilizing people, right? And, and I wanted to just kind of pause on that for a second, because this is something you and I spoke about when, when we talked on my show, Working People, right, you mentioned like the importance of raising your own consciousness when, you know, you were incarcerated and like how that was not only like a life-saving thing, because if you, I mean, if you're not working on that and you're in the most horrible, hopeless place imaginable, eventually everyone's going to get eaten alive at, you know if they're not working on something like that they're not working on raising consciousness and organizing their their fellow uh prisoners and even like trying to organize and make those connections beyond the prison walls and so we're going to get to that in a second but i just i wanted to ask what it meant to you to get into those conversations to read those books to think about that because I mean, you grew up in a very segregated, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Washington, D.C., in a very segregated mm -hmm. America. Black people were very much second class mm -hmm. citizens and the white establishment made sure that you knew it every step of the mm -hmm. way. So, like, what did what did like learning that type of politics and political theory, like what did it mean for you personally at that moment in your life? See, then it gave you purpose because mm -hmm. now you understand who you are in relation to society more so than being reaction in a reaction to society. Now you understand that you have the power and the ability to change mm. conditions because you got a, a, a method of thinking that's gonna allow you to understand the phenomena, those conditions that are you confronted with and how to be effective in changing. And that's what it meant to me. It started it it opened my eyes up to the point that I understood that if I if I continue to educate myself, if I continue to stay relevant in terms of information, if I continue to be analytical in terms of what's going on in the world, if I make the connection between, as Malcolm was doing, when Malcolm talked about he had an international perspective, but he was talking about when, and when he made his international analysis, he was saying that, oh, it's all capitalism and imperialism. Mm. So if, if, if you look at it only as 
of the United States and the United States and that the United States is being responsible for during the time when uh, Anzania, Zimbabwe, Namibia, mm -hmm. you know, Tanzania, they not, they, you don't look at them in respect in terms of how the imperialist power is like uh, destroying countries abroad, Vietnam, then we always going to be looking like in in isolation and looking at things in a real myopic view. Mm -hmm. So it gave me a it gave me a broad perspective and and you know to reflect back on like Eddie because when you the thing with Eddie was you have a conversation with Eddie. He's a, he's an astute political thinker. Mm -hmm. So you have a conversation with him. He not he not looking at you like oh I can outthink you. I know more about this. He actually look talking to you to get you to understand how to develop your thinking. Mm. So his, his conversation with you is, he asking you questions to get you to figure something out mm. about a particular thing to see what, he, what more I gotta do to you to get you to understand this so that you can be the person that you need to be to go forth and, and move this nerd. So his conversation might be like, if he, be, he, might, he might come up and say like, uh, well, why do you think uh, Malcolm and King didn't get along. Mm -hmm. Or what what was the problem between them? And he already in his mind he always saying like it they it wasn't that they didn't get along. It was just that they had two different perspectives of social conditions. Or then he might come back and ask you like, who do you think was more effective mm -hmm. in that in that? Naturally everybody gonna say Malcolm, but the reality was King because who was more effective in terms of creating an organization that changed the Montgomery boy, bus boycott. They had people dis dismantle institutions. But he wants you to, he wants to see where you at. So once you go and say Malcolm, then he gonna dial down on you. Why? And all your conversation going and going to like his rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And not saying that Malcolm, his, his oratorial skills and his educational skills wasn't valuable, but when it converted into practicality, he died before he had a chance. Because mm. when he came with OAU, he started to set up a political platform, mm -hmm. right? King and him was already, uh, had already did the uh, March on Washington, Poor People's Campaign. They was organizing in the South. They was, you know, they, so they was doing a lot of things. And Eddie would have you in that conversation. So then, you argue, he might argue, you might argue, have an argument with him for like a week on end, <laughs> and he'll start throwing more and more stuff at you. Like, mm -hmm. but have you read this? Go, go back and read this and tell me why you, why you, you know, how that how that fit into your analysis. Mm. And at the end, you'll be like, man, yeah, he right. Mm -hmm. And he won't tell you that I agree with Ken. He won't say I disagree with Malcolm. He'll just be letting you know that in making an analysis. How you how you make your analysis? Your analysis is going to, have to be converted into the application. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Your analysis is not you're not being an armchair revolutionary. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're not being like Dr. King say a paralysis of analysis. You're not making a paralysis of now. You actually saying, uh, okay, this is the problem. Why? This is the solution. How are we going to implement this mm -hmm. in this in this in this particular situation that we find ourselves? We're going to phase it in like this. And that was the thing about Eddie. Everybody I know that dealt with him, made all our comrades that was that was educated by him or respond to him. All of us thought the same way. And those of us that didn't that couldn't cut the mustard, they just didn't participate. Yeah. But those of us that could cut the mustard, whenever we whenever as we got older and migrated out to different institutions, you knew that we was in them institutions because when you come in there, First thing they say, oh, what, uh, who in there? They say Max. Oh, what Max doing? Because they know you organize. They know you got some kind of program, mm -hmm. some kind of project, some going on. They got people involved, and you got access to resources that can get the population involved. So they gonna be like, Max, man, look, I'm, uh, I know you're doing something. I know you, you mm -hmm. got some kind of, you know, function going on. You got people coming in. You got some kind because that's that's what we was left with. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, like. It's weird to like smile hearing that because again, we're talking about a prison industrial complex that is itself like 
an inhumane institution of violence that is meant to swallow and destroy people. It's not meant to rehabilitate yeah. anybody. It's meant to destroy people. And that's what it does, sadly, to so many. Um, but to even think that in those sorts of conditions that they couldn't kill the spirit of the Panthers. They couldn't kill the spirit of revolution, of, of revolutionary thought. And, and whether that be with Eddie and y'all in the Maryland penitentiary, or like you said, then you kind of travel out like spores to these other institutions and you bring other folks in. You had those conversations and, and um, reading those same texts and, and just kind of seeing that ripple effect. That's what really hit me at Eddie's memorial. Cause I just, I was feeling so self-pitying and, and like lamenting all the conversations that I didn't get to have with him mm -hmm. and would never get the chance to have. I mean, at Eddie's memorial, that was the first time I ever met him in person. Um, because during COVID, after 44 years in prison, like Eddie had to be on lockdown because of all the damage that had, prison had done to his body. So before we had the vaccines, like I was just working with him remotely, but I feel like I still got to know him very well. But anyway, like I, up until his memorial, I was thinking about all the things I wanted to ask him or talk to him about, but now wouldn't get to. And then I just heard all the other people tell their <laughs> stories about him. And I feel like that was me having those conversations. I got exactly, to learn everything exactly. I wanted to about Eddie through all the people whose lives he had touched, including you. And like, I think that's just, it's a sign of a truly great organizer and teacher what you said right that that i think and that's something that we all recognize in eddie someone at the memorial said a line that really caught my ear where they said eddie saw the light in people before we even saw it in ourselves yeah that, and that would that's an accurate description i salim alamine said when, when i when he came in and i seen him he said so we was talking he's a devout muslim right and he said first thing he said uh he said uh i said he said oh yeah he said this is where i got my political education from because that's what Eddie did. See, Eddie didn't look like the brother spoke about being a Muslim. Eddie didn't say, don't be a Muslim. Eddie say, how is your, what you believe in, how is it helping your people? Mm -hmm. How is it better in your, your, your environment? How is it better in the conditions of your people? If it ain't better in the conditions of your people, you might need to be evaluate that. Mm -hmm. Because you now when you in a, 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 we was talking about Jeff Bezos, now you're in a position where you're starting to look at yourself in the same light as, a, a blood sucker. Mm -hmm. that, so you don't have no relationship with your people, or you don't have no connection with oppressed people. You don't feel like the conditions of that your family's in is a problem for you. Something wrong with your thinking. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's like it's such a great way um, to put that. Um, and 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 again, the thing that I think makes Eddie and you and every and everyone who's involved in that such a, an effective organizer is because you ultimately recognize that it's that other people have to walk through that door themselves right like like you said you can't just talk at people you can't control people to think the way you want them to think you have to respect their agency as a human being and as an individual who has to go through their own struggle of developing consciousness there's a real profound respect for other people in that way and said like you know like i'm asking those questions but like you're the one who has to kind mm -hmm. of respond to them you're the one who has to think these things through and then tell me what you came up with right and like i think that yeah that's that's something that a, a, a lesson that eddie taught me that i try to really carry on in in the work that i do when i talk to workers i never ever ever want to talk down to anyone never act like I know more, you know, right. than they do. Like really just try to kind of be eye to eye with people and talk amongst ourselves as fellow human beings who all have our own struggles, but who are all kind of part of the larger struggle together. And I guess like on that note, um, maybe kind of round things out, I wanted to sort of like think about what that means in the larger historical context that you and Eddie are like, Chap your chapters of that history, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, I think a lot of folks in my generation, especially those who are on the left, sadly can forget when we talk about, like, oh, what happened to the left in the United States or in the West after 1968, right? And so we'll talk about where the radicals 
predominantly the white radicals of the student movement, um, so on and so forth, like what happened to them? And we forget that an entire chunk of the radical left was either assassinated right. uh, or imprisoned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're talking like some of the most dedicated revolutionaries um, like Eddie Conway, like, and, and we just sort of, yeah, we forget that, that, that the system like actually attacked the people it saw as the greatest threat yeah. um, to its hegemony and swallowed them into the prison industrial complex. Like Eddie has a great line in, in one of his books where he's like, the moment black people started rising up and demanding accountability from a white supremacist system in the form of the civil rights movement, the black power movement, that's when the prison started swelling with mm -hmm. black bodies, right? So it was a clear reaction. The, the boom of the prison industrial complex was a reaction from white supremacist capitalist society to take in, you know, those threats. And yet, even in the gut of the prison industrial complex, you guys wouldn't shut up. You yeah. wouldn't go away. You were still organizing. You were still thinking and raising consciousness and, and putting on conferences in, in the prison yeah. and, and organizing labor unions. And, and even not just that, if it's not at that grand of a level, just helping other brothers, sisters in different institutions not lose themselves, right? Just, just, Again, that was what stood out to me at Eddie's Memorials. There's so many people, even like yourself, who could have gone another way. Mm -hmm. But because you got into this collective, you got into this conversation, you got invested in that struggle, you know, like you, you, you didn't go that other way. And so I wanted to just sort of ask, like, like for folks watching and listening who maybe don't understand the significance of what you and Eddie and your generation of radicals, like, what it really means that y'all were swallowed up by the prison industrial complex, but use that time still to organize. Like, what do you think people should should know about that? Just you know, when we just the reality, you know, fascism, capitalism, and, and racism, they use uh, fascist tactics. You know, same way they did the Gestapo. Where Hitler had the Gestapo round people up and put them in concentration. Well, they use that when they rounded up and kill, like you say, the ones they didn't kill, they rounded up and put them in prison. But what they did in doing that, that these elements, these revolutionaries, these nationalists, these civil rights activists, when they came, they come in, they come in with a different discipline. They don't come into prison and say, oh, fool, bad, we gonna accept it where a person that's a, have a criminal mentality, that's you know, a recidivist, they're accustomed to it. They come in and find their niche, their comfortability, and accept the t conditions as they are. But when you start putting that other element in there, that was like putting a fuse in the dynamite. Mm. Because now you got somebody that's gonna say, oh no, food bad. Food ain't supposed to be bad. Food's supposed to be better, and we gotta do something about it. And when they say, well, what you gonna do about it? I say, we not gonna go in the kitchen and eat. Mm. And we gonna make them give us better food. And so now, a person that might not be have a propensity to be a radical or organizer or just want to you know do his time and get by. But now when they say, man, don't go in the kitchen, and he see that the food didn't change, say, oh, that's all it took was for me to stand up. This is what, did, when, you put, when you put Panthers in the prison system, they got people to, to I think like uh, Mal, uh, Dr. King say like, you know, straighten your back up. Mm -hmm. They got people to straighten their back up and start saying no. We're not going to tolerate inhumane living conditions, no matter what you say or why we're here. And as a result of that, they became more political. John Cliche, Flea the Drum, they weren't, they weren't George Jackson. They weren't revolutionaries when they came in the system. They became politicized in the system as a result of other people that, that came in. Mm -hmm. And they was exposed to, uh, Conrad George even mentioned, uh, being exposed to certain people that Raised it, that raised his consciousness. Uh, Eddie Conway, the uh, the people that was in that collective with us, none of us was former Panthers. Most of us were petty criminals, or criminals in our own right. But when we got exposed to Eddie Conway, and Eddie Conway educated us to understand that 
you know, our way of looking at things is wrong on all levels. And unless we change, we're going to continue to be in the state that we're in. But if we change, we're not going to be, we might not live, but we will, we, we, we leave a legacy of making changes. So when you, that's what people need to take away from this is that when you look at what uh, the Citizen Project is doing there called 50 Years and Wake Up, they saying that prison, the, the expanded prison industrial complex started 50 years ago. So this is the anniversary of it. And they're doing a series of things in terms of educating people. The point with in that 50 years, that 60, when, when, when they started locking Panthers up, when they started locking the militants up, when they started locking members of the Republic of New Africa up, when they started, when they locked up uh, Ben Chavis and them in, in the, uh, Wilmington 10, when they locked them up, when the institutions they went in, they went in them institutions, and they went in them institutions thinking that I'm, I know who the enemy is, and I know that this is just a part of the process, and I still got to have to fight. I don't not, not want to fight. I'm going to organize in here. I'm going to make people aware of what's going on here. I'm going to educate these. these I'm doing, these are the masses that I have exposure to right now, this prison population. So I'm going to take these masses of people. I'm not going to say, well, oh, the mass is on the outside of the wall. Mm. So right until I get out, all, you know, organize, organize it on suspension. No, these are the people. I got to change this thinking. If I can change this thinking and make these guys and get these guys and women to understand their place, then they're going to change. And that's what you see now. So when you see a person like myself and the fact that Eddie, you know, bestowed his honor on me to be a part of this process, that wasn't by happenstance. He knew what he, he knew what he created. And he knew when he seen me when I got out. His only his wife told me, and we laugh about this, she said, all he would say is, man, if, if Master just can get out. Because he knew I, I I would I had like I might go in World Book of Guinness for the most failed attempt of escapes. <laughs> <laughs> and so he knew I had this mm -hmm. thing with me. So he was like, if he just get out Mm -hmm. Because he knew that once I got out and he exposed me to what we were doing, the work that we were doing, then he knew I would find my place because he, I was educated to be a part of the process. Oh, yeah, man. Well, again, we are honored to have you part of the Real News team. You're doing incredible work here, brother. And, yeah, I think we got a lot more work to do in his much as our hearts are broken, um, you know, with, with Eddie leaving us, I know that Eddie would be the first person to say, don't mourn, organize. Right? Yeah, we yeah, got exactly. to get back to work. And <laughs> exactly. I guess in that vein, I just wanted to sort of ask, like, if you had any kind of final words you wanted to share with your audience um, about um, how we're going to carry on Eddie's legacy and, or, or, or what lessons they should really sit with and... and take into their own lives. You know, Eddie created Rattling the Bars to be the, the voice of the voiceless. And the term Rattling the Bars come from when we was locked up on South Wing in the most arduous, treacherous, inhumane part of the prison. And in order to get the attention of the guards when something happened, somebody was sick, we would rattle the bars and beat on the bar. We'd make so much noise. They had to respond. The symbolism of that is that George called the rumbling of our feet. The symbolism of that is that we're asking you to continue to support Rattling the Bar. That's what, Ed, that's what Eddie would want, for you to support this, to critique this, to offer your suggestions, to offer your criticism, so that we can make this better. Because this is your voice. It's the voice of the voices. And this is what the real news represent. It's not called the real news by happenstance. It's the, it really is the real news. And we want y'all to continue to support. That's what Eddie would want. And that's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you to be patient with me as I go through this process. But more importantly, I'm asking you to, to listen to what we're doing, support what we're doing, and be a part of this process. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.